Hello, everyone. Good day. Welcome to this lecture on one of the important topics in philosophy of religion uh, on the faith and reason. Um, in this lecture, I will sketch very briefly Jean-Luc Marion's take on the relationship between faith and reason found in his famous essay titled Faith and Reason. But before we engage in details, Marian's faith and reason, let us first revisit the old age uh, faith reason debates. Um, the scholarship on faith and reason is quite huge, but for brevity's sake, I will focus only on the most important concepts of faith and reason that would serve as a jumping board for this lecture. I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation here. So what I will do is read a note and then do some side discussions. Okay. Um, so Jean-Luc Marion on faith and reason. Since, first of all, since the time of the ancient Greek thinkers, there were scholars who viewed faith and reason as diametrically opposed to each other. While some scholars argue that faith and reason are in harmony with each other. And so what I would like to try to uh, show here in this, in, this, in this introductory lecture or the introductory parts on, on this lecture is that um, there is this debate between um, you know, faith and reason, between the, 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 those comes who argue that um, we could not reconcile faith and reason, and from the other come who argue that um, reason and faith are complementary. So uh, that's what I will be briefly sketching here in the historical development of of the debates between faith or, or on the faith and reason debates. Uh, but later on, as I will show later, um, I will situate Marion's, Jean-Luc Marion's take on the relationship between faith and reason. And just to preempt the discussion on that, uh, for Marion, there is no contradiction between faith and reason. But before that, let me continue with the, um, um, discussion on the background and context of, of Marian's take on faith and reason. So as we can see, the conflict between faith and reason as he law has a long history. From the ancient Greeks to the medieval Christian theologians, the rise of science, science proper in the early modern periods and the reformulation of the issue as one of science versus religion in the 20th century, okay? For example, uh, for the famous ancient Greek philosopher, Plato, God is transcendent, the highest and most perfect being, and one who uses eternal forms or archetypes to fashion a universe that is eternal and uncreated. And Plato believes that there must be a measure of goodness to identify God as benevolent. So when, when, when Plato said that there, is a, there must be a measure of goodness that we can employ in, in making sense or in identifying God as benevolent, as generous, as good in, uh, in general, um, that shows for, for, for Plato that even if we could not really experience um, God or that mysterious being out there or that form of that good, but there is some kind of, you know, uh, a measure or, or a standard that is universal that everyone can access or can employ in, in making sense of God or in, in identifying God as benevolent. Although Plato did not clearly talk about faith, um, of course, we have. Uh, please note that um, we could not find in the in the works of Plato a, a kind of sustained discussion or engagements on the notion of faith. There is no, um, I should say, there is no sustained discussion or engagement on the idea of faith. But Plato's belief in a transcendent God is 
I should say, is a product of faith. Okay? Um, that God, that being cannot be, be known by the human mind. And so therefore the understanding or our belief of that ultimate reality or that good is precisely a product of faith. But it is obvious that for Plato, this belief is backed up by or a product of reason. Okay, so hence, we can glean from this contention that for Plato, faith and reason are in harmony with each other. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, there is the idea, there is the belief in Plato that the, there are some um, absolute being out there, or there's the goods, or there's this, in this theory of force, there is this, this uh, supreme being out there, which cannot be accessed which can be known by the senses, and yet we believe in that because, look, reason tells us that um, a supreme being is, is existing out there. In relative parlance, Aristotle, and we know that um, Aristotle was uh, Plato's most famous student who wrote the physics. In his uh, famous work titled Physics, demonstrated the existence of the unmoved mover as a timeless self-thinker from the evidence of the existence of motion in, in, in the world. Um, and later on, oh, we know that if you're familiar with St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, Aquinas developed or developed farther or made use of Aristotle's arguments in proving the existence of God. Um, in in St. Thomas Aquinas cosmological um, arguments for the existence of God in his idea of the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, um, the uncaused cause, or the or supreme being. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas um, appropriated Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's arguments of the unmoved mover. The idea here is, of course, we can see or we can witness in the universe a constant motion, a constant change. And, um, and this, this endless constant change. And for Aristotle, it is impossible to, to conceive of this constant change, constant motion, endless motion without, up, without you know, um, associating the idea or thinking about the move mover that is responsible for all this change. So there, so in other words, for Aristotle, there is in, in this in this constant change in this constant motion, there must be somebody who's responsible for it, and he called that unmoved mover. Viewed as God by many medieval thinkers, such as Aquinas, it is clear that Aristotle's belief on the unmoved mover is a product of both faith and reason, just like his master Plato. Yeah? So hence, just like Plato, Aristotle believes that there is no contradiction between faith and reason. So they complement each other. You have this belief on something, you know, that we cannot experience, that we cannot touch, that we cannot see, and yet reason tells us by way of logic, for example, or by way of logical thinking, by way of deep thinking, for example, and then we, we can conclude that indeed there is this unmoved mover out there, there is this absolute reality out there. Okay, so it, it is that idea of, of a supreme being, of an unmoved mover, is accessed by both faith and reason. And then let's move to the medieval periods. Okay, so that's for, for the ancient Greek thinkers, the ancient periods. For the medieval philosophers, faith and reason were considered as possible sources of genuine wisdom or knowledge. And of course, we know in, in, in the philosophies of, of, of Augustine and Aquinas and the rest of the scholastic philosophers during the medieval periods, except William of Ockham, the last of the last of the scholastics, um, these philosophers argue that, look, uh, reason and faith are complementary are complementary. Hence, for the medieval thinkers such as uh, St. Augustine and, and St. Thomas Aquinas, reason and faith are complementary. 
although it was clear that the medieval thinkers put more emphasis on faith. Um, of course, the, the, that's, that's quite obvious. During the medieval period, it was, the, there was the primacy of faith. Um, um, but we cannot deny the fact that um, this, these church leaders, these religious thinkers appropriated reason you know, uh, in their belief. For Augustine, for example, faith and reason are inseparable. He argued that it was good and natural to employ the rational capacity we have been created with to search for an understanding of the truths we accept from the authority of the biblical revelation, even though a true understanding of, of God will only be possible after this life when we see him face to face, of course, if you believe in the afterlife, you know, we can only say, that, yeah, yeah, that's God, once we see him face to face. But even then, even if we are still, you know, in this material world, according to Augustine, of course, we can, you know, um, make sense of what and who God is, including his nature and characteristics, because we have the capacity, you know, to know him we have been in other words we have been given that rational capacity to know things beyond experience including god himself for, uh, for, for, for saint thomas aquinas or saint thomas aquinas believes that human reason without uh supernatural aid can establish the existence of god and the immortality of the soul for those who cannot or do not engage in such strenuous intellectual activity, however, these matters are also revealed and can be known by faith. And so what Aquinas is saying is that when it comes to understanding God and the immortality of the soul, he said that we can know it, we can justify the existence of God by reason alone. We don't need some kind of supernatural aid, you know? So he, Again, for Aquinas, uh, um, God or mysterious beings or the immortality of the soul can be known for reason, can be demonstrated through the use of reason. Okay? But he said, if, if a person cannot use reason in demonstrating or in understanding the nature and dynamics of God, then he or she can make use of faith. So both reason and faith for St. Thomas Aquinas can be employed or can be used to understand God, to, to, to make sense of his nature and dynamics. So again, there is no contradiction for, for, for Augustine and, and for Aquinas, there is no contradiction between faith and reason. But, William of Ockham, the last of the scholastic philosophers of the medieval periods, argues that faith and reason conflict with each other. Hence, the goal of William of Ockham's nominalism um, is to separate faith from reason. Okay. Um, of course, um, um, when I say uh, William of Ockham, William of Ockham is the last of the scholastics. Of course, this, this is now towards the end of the medieval periods. Uh, we know that in history of philosophy, after William of Ockham, we have Descartes as the first, René Descartes as the first philosopher of the modern or the early modern period. And so, and so, um, um, yeah, Ockham was the last uh, scholastic philosopher. So he was the last philosopher of the medieval periods. And according to records, according to history, of course, after Ockham, we now have, you know, the, you know, move to the early modern period. Yeah. And so of course, still, um, um, William of Ockham is a scholar of the church. Um, and his, although his intention was to separate faith from reason, um, he remains a religious, uh, believer who he remains a believer um, because for because the contention of Ockham is that look um, faith is in danger under uh, reason because reason tried to question everything and so 
and so for our communities, it, it, it is much better, you know, if we just uh, leave faith alone and, and, you know, free it from reason. And, and I think, I think um, that's, that's how uh, William Alcom tried to risk, rescue our uh, scholasticism of faith during the time. Now, from the medieval period, this move to the modern period. Um, just like William of Alcom, some philosophers in the modern period believe that faith and reason are contradictories. David Hume also um, uh, is a concrete example of that. Uh, but let me just make use of um, Kierkegaard as our concrete example here. So for, for, for Solon Kierkegaard, or Solon Kierkegaard argue that faith is opposed to reason and is firmly in the realm of the irrational. Okay? So um, of, of course, we know that um, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard was considered as the father of existentialism. And well, he, of course, he was a brilliant philosopher, but he was a, uh, but, but, but Kierkegaard is a, 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 a believer, a, a, a theist philosopher. And, and, and the forerunner of modern existentialism. And if we, and so of course, Kierkegaard made use of reason, of course, but when it comes to his little faith, and his, when it comes to uh, belief in God, and if we re revisit his three stages of life, you know, the static stage, the ethical stage, and the religious stage, we know that of course, in the, in the aesthetic stage, the human person is concerned with material things and fame and pleasure. And, and yeah, that's what dominates in, in, in one's life, in the aesthetic's life, and the, until such time that he, he or the human person got bored or encounter experienced boredom and anxiety and things like that. And so he's faced with or it's okay to guard the human person is faced with a choice either to remain in that meaningless rubbish life or to move into the higher next stage, into higher stage, the next stage, which is the ethical stage. And, and, and yeah, so if, if, uh, uh, if, if the person proceeds to uh, the next stage, um, it involves some kind of commitments, you know, in this existentialism, the idea of making a decision to to really you know um, make life meaningful, and then in the ethical stage, according to Kierkegaard, guards, although this is ruled by this is characterized by following rules, obeying some some normative standards in society, but time will come that the human person will experience again boredom, anxiety, and other um, and other you know. Uh, negative feelings. And so um, the human person will be faced with an either or situation. And, and either he or she remains in that ethical stage or uh, he or she moves to the, to, the, to the next, the third and highest stage, which is the religious stage. And if the person decides to move to the, to, to, um, move to the religious stage, and then he, he or she needs to have some kind of little faith, okay? And that little faith is characterized by, you know, um, and that little faith is, is, is not irra irrational, it, it should not be understood, you know, um, irrationality here should not be understood uh, 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 from the vantage points of, or should not be, treated as, as not thinking at all. But I think the most appropriate term for that is post-rational because the little faith for Kierkegaard is indeed a kind of, you know, that little faith um, does not involve reason. You know, you just, you just do it because you believe, you know, that's the right thing to do. You believe that's, that's what God wants you to do. That is why that's irrational for, for Kierkegaard or post-rational. And, and that's also the reason why in 
30 guard um, um, appropriated um, or made use of, of, of Abraham's art of sacrificing his son, Asa, as an example of that like, leap of faith. Um, we know already that um, God, according to um, the Bible, uh, according to the Old Testament, um, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac, to prove his loyalty or his promise in God or in him. And yeah, Abraham being a religious person and a and, um, loyal person or committed person, so he, he followed, he obeyed God, and then he was about to sacrifice his life. So uh, according to Kifiga, that is a, a concrete example of a leap of faith. You know, Abraham did not question God. He just followed, he just obeyed the command of God. So, so in that sense, there is no reason in it. In it in, in terms of in terms of belief, in terms of faith, in terms of religion, in terms of belief, um, Kierkegaard says, you know, um, reason will not work here. So it's faith is of uh, paramount importance here. For Kierkegaard, religious faith is over and above reason and is not to be subject to criteria generally used by reasoning beings. Hence, for Kierkegaard, to use reason on matters of faith is not only inappropriate, but ir uh, irreverent and faithless. Okay? So um, sometimes when we do some, um, um, like, like, like the case of Abraham, when, when you know that God asked you to do that, you just do it because you, you believe you're convinced, that that's what you ought to do, you know, because God commands it. You do not question, <laughs> you obey. So if, if you, according to Kierkegaard, if we marry faith and reason, and, and that's inappropriate for Kierkegaard, and even, that's even uh, considered as irreverence and faithless. Now, the classic debate on the relationship between faith and reason continues to challenge the contemporary landscape, okay? It continues to inspire theologians and philosophers alike to dig deeper into the nature of and relationship between faith and reason. And one of the most famous and influential philosophers in the contemporary times that attempts to contribute to addressing this issue was the French philosopher Jean-Luc Marion. Okay, so as I mentioned a while ago, um, what I have just presented is a brief historical sketch on, on the uh, faith recent debate from the, from the ancient Greek period to very briefly to the medieval and the modern. And so, as I said, that debate continues to um, dominate the religious contemporary religious landscape. And, and again, one of the one of uh, the thinkers, one of the most famous influential philosophers today in the contemporary period who attempt, who attempts to contribute in addressing, uh, again, uh, the issue, the, the, the faith reason debate is Jean Luc Marion. Jean Luc Marion is a famous French philosopher and one of the leading Catholic thinkers of our time. Uh, just very briefly on his, on his bio notes of his life. He is a formidable authority on René Descartes. Uh, René Descartes, the, the father of modern philosophy, the first considered to be the first philosopher of the early modern period. He also followed, uh, he, he came after the last scholastic philosopher, thinker, William Faulkner. So again, um, uh, again, uh, Jean-Luc Marion is a formidable authority on René Descartes and a major scholar in the philosophy of religion. He is currently a professor emeritus at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Paris, Paris 4, Sorbonne. 
and concurrently Andrew uh, Thomas Greeley and Grace Nichols Greeley Professor of Catholic Studies and Professor of Philosophy of Religion and Theology at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Marian, uh, Marian works at the intersection between or of contemporary phenomenology, the history of philosophy and Christian theology. So in what follows, again, I will sketch very briefly Jean-Luc Marion's take on the relationship between faith and reason found in his famous essay titled, Faith and Reason. Okay, so to begin with, it must be noted that it must be noted at the outset that in faith and reason, Marion claims that faith and reason are not opposed to each other. So again, this is what I mentioned uh, a while ago in my presentation of the historical, brief historical sketch on the faith reason debate from the ancient Greek periods, Plato until um, um, Kierkegaard, uh, I situate in this in this lecture, I situate the the take of Marion on faith reason debates, and the position of Marion is that faith and reason are not opposed to each other. Okay, as is often supposed, but faith has its own rationality, namely unfolding the reason of the logos as the gift of love. Towards the end of towards the end of this uh, video lecture, um, we will be talking about the idea of love, especially God or Jesus Christ, love as the great reason. For Marian, since modernity reduces everything known to objects and hence leads to nihilism, Christians have a duty to rationality. When you say reduces everything uh, known to objects, uh, I think uh, if you're familiar with the idea of um, instrumental thinking, when I mean, that kind of thinking, that kind of attitude is treating things around us, including human beings, as objects to be manipulated, to be taken advantage of, to be controlled. For example, in 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 when we, for example, if you talk about human relations, uh, humans have the tendency to relate with someone who is rich and famous, or someone who has, let's say, resources, so that we can maybe take advantage of of, of that resources, of the richness and then fame of the other person. And so, yeah, so when we reduce that something into objects, that clearly shows a dehumanization of that something, of that person. Yeah. And so, again, um, uh, for Marian, the modern periods, modernity, is also characterized by the reduction of everything, including human beings, into objects. And because that is happening right the, 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 and because of that as i will show later um, marion argues that christians have the duty to rationality and later on when they say have the duty to rationality that means for or or for for marion that can be concretely instantiated by you no know, loving the other anyway um, I will go to that later. So in fact, Marion urges us to exercise a greater reason, namely a rationality of the flesh and love, which gives Christ's logos to the world as gift. He, I will, you will understand this fully later when I go to the specificity of Marion's um, faith and reason. As Christians, according to Marion, we must hand on the love we have received. Such love is unconditioned and enables both true self-knowledge and genuine knowledge of the other. 
saw with that very brief um, overview of Marian's uh, faith and reason. It is now, um, it is now go into the details. It is now engage Marian's um, essay titled Faith and Reason. So I will be discussing now the key concepts of Marian's essay titled Faith and Reason. First, it must be noted that Marion equates faith with believing and reason with knowing. So that's the opening paragraph of the essay. To be specific for Marion, faith is believing without certainty. It's believing in something that you cannot know, that you cannot, ex that you cannot experience. You can only demonstrate through reason. So you you believe in it without certainty, that's faith. While reason is knowing through definition of science. What does that mean? Of course, when um, um, scientific, for example, in this context of science, there are criteria to uh, comply or to, to, to satisfy in the act of knowing or reasoning. From this, we have this basic definition and difference between faith and reason. According to Marion, faith is the belief in the truth of something that does not require any evidence and may not be provable by any empirical or rational means. Reason, on the other hand, is the faculty of the mind through which we can logically come to rational conclusions. As we can see, this appears to be an obvious opposition at first. You know, so if, 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 you, if you don't think deeply, uh, apparently, you know, if we define faith and reason that way, uh, they uh, appear to us as contradictories. However, if we think deeply and analyze it thoroughly, as Marion would have us believe, this opposition is artificial. This is because for Marion, faith has its reason and scientific reason has its beliefs. Okay, so there is, because the rationality, uh, uh, faith has its own rationality, faith has its own reason. And in science, in scientific reason, there is belief in it. And for Marion, it is the business of the philosopher, of the thinker, to demystify this confusion, to show and demonstrate how artificial this opposition is. And so you see, this is also this is um, uh, this is what we meant by when 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 Marion said Christianity has the duty to rationality. This issue, he is actually referring to this, that it is our business as Christians, it is our obligation as Christians to demonstrate that that apparent, at first, at first glance, that apparent opposition between faith and reason is actually artificial, is not, so that, 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 that at the end of the day, there is no contradiction or opposition between faith and reason. We will know that later. And so I move now to the first section of the essay on Christian faith as rationality. According to Marion, Christians them, themselves should be the first to realize that their faith cannot and must not in any way do without reason, nor should they pride themselves on doing without it. So again, just to reiterate, to, to, to emphasize this part, um, um, Marion says, we cannot have faith without reason. And that clearly shows again, that faith and reason are not contradictories, they're not opposed to each other. 
I, I, I put a, a, a note here, an example uh, I wrote here. For example, taking the Eucharist, if you're a Catholic example. This belief, as, uh, this belief has rather a, a rational basis. For example, when I take the body of Christ, I believe that I welcome Christ to my life and that my sins are forgiven. So for, and so for, for if, if we do not, if we just resort to faith without reason in this, in this case, uh, people may not fully understand, may not make sense more meaningfully of the sacraments of the Eucharist if they just perform the ritual out of faith, if they do not understand what, what, what they're doing. Many of the Catholics, for example, simply, simply take Christ during Mass because they thought that's, that's just a ritual, that's what they need to do. And, and that's their obligation as, as, as Christians. They need to, you know, as part of the Mass, that ritual should be performed until they uh, take the body of Christ. But for, for in, in my case, this is, uh, this is my example. Um, in, in the case of the Eucharist, in this case, if you combine reason and faith, for example, uh, when I take the, uh, again, in the example, when I take the body of Christ, I do not just perform that. I do, I, I, I do not just do it because I'm, I'm under obligation to do that because I'm Christian, but I take the body of Christ. I perform the sacraments of Eucharist because I believe that if I, because I, I believe that that is a symbol of letting Christ come into my life, into my life, into my heart, into my, into my being. And so I welcome Christ into my life. And so, I, and so, and so it's just, it's, it symbolizes as well forgiveness as well. So I, I take the body of Christ, I ask forgiveness and I take, the body of Christ, and uh, and I believe that through that, my sins are forgiven. Yeah? So it's not just a ritual. This uh, this uh, this an irrational. It is a the irrational behind that. Uh, I should say sacrament. In fact, Marion argues that believing without reason is an insult to God. Yeah? In simple terms, of course, God gives us reason. God gives us this, this ability to think, to reason out, to justify, to demonstrate his existence, to know him by way of logical reasoning, for example. And if we do not make use of our reason, according to Marion, that is a form of insult to God himself. Marion writes, believing without knowing how or what to believe does not increase faith, but leads it astray, maybe even ridicules it. So you see, going back to the example again, if, if you take the Eucharist, if you take the body of Christ, if you perform the sacrament of Eucharist, if you just take the body of Christ because uh, you, you believe that as, as a Catholic, you know, attends a mass, you need to do it without understanding without a rational basis of that action, without understanding that, look, the main reason why you need to take the Eucharist because you need to take the body of Christ because you welcome Christ into your life. And in that way, Christ dwells in your hearts and then, and then, and then that leads to the forgiveness of your sins. So that's exactly the rational of the act itself, of the belief of, of the faith in, you know, in Christ, you know, faith in that particular action or sacrament. So for Marion, the believer will have to give an accounting to God who stands 
ready to judge the living and the dead, as Marion writes. The point of giving an account here actually is not to quarrel with the interlocutor God face to face, as in ideological battle, but to do justice to him in whom we say we believe, in him and in his high reason. So giving an account is justifying, is making use of reason, is explaining through rational means and things like that. Hence, as Marion would have us believe, it is the duty of Christians to provide justification to their beliefs and this necessarily implies the use of reason, okay? So we do not just believe because we are told to do so. In fact, again, as, as Catholics, we, from the very beginning, when we were colonized by the Spaniards, we were not asked to choose between Catholicism and Protestantism, or we were not asked to choose between, you know, and among religions. Christianity was just imposed on us, and we just follow without questioning. And many of our brothers and sisters in the Philippines, many of our brothers and sisters simply perform the, the ritual you know, without justification, without you know, making use of reason, without explaining it, without you know, just, justifying it. And many, in fact, of our uh, uh, um, brothers and sisters in, in, in Catholicism who pray the rosary out of ritual, out of just need to recite it because we are told to do so. But if you pray the rosary, if you're a Catholic, of course, if you pray the rosary because you believe that this is, this is the best meditation form of meditation out there, and it's the best way to connect with God, with the most mysterious being out there. And then look, you, know, you justify your belief. And that requires, of course, reason, according to Marian. Marian asks, why does God expect us to speak of him with arguments, reason, and rationality? Does God not know better than all of us that we can neither comprehend him nor even reason correctly about him without taking into account our fear of those who do not accept him? And then Marian answers, according to Marian, yet if God is God, he knows all that and more. You don't need to, everything that you, everything, um, if it, of course, if you ask the question, okay, what's, 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 what's the point? For example, in, in other words, what's the point? Example of, of, of praying, of, of asking, of, of all these things, you know, that God already knows already from the very beginning what will be the result. What's the point of, of, of praying to, you know, for, for guidance in the exam or things like that? Or, or some argues that, well, yeah, uh, I'm suffering because I experience sufferings and sufferings in life because God is testing my faith. That's the point of arguing or using that arguments where in fact, you know exactly that God is an all-knowing being. He knows exactly the result of the test. So what's the point then? According to Maria, again, yet if God is God, he knows all that and more. Thus, if he asks us to speak with reason, without a doubt, he has good reason for asking it of us. And Marian father asks, what do we know about this reason or these reasons? Marian says, we know at least this. The Christian religion announces the death and resurrection of a human being who was and thus still is God. This man, Jesus Christ, is called the Logos, the words, and hence the reason. Even the paradox of his crucifixion, 
which contradicts the wisdom of the world remains a logos, means a logos reason, the ancient uh, Greek notion of logos, reason, remains a logos, the logos of the cross, the reason of the cross, which opposes a different Sophia or wisdom to the wisdom of the world, namely the wisdom of God. That's his way. You know, that's God's way. God's wisdom according to Marian. Marian father says, the announcements of the word come to reveal God in his humanity. To humanity unfolds a new and superior reason, which can only be unfolded with reasons. The logos is not optional for Christians because he from whom they take their name bears the title of logos. For better or worse, or for better or for worse, they had to take up again the knowledge of the Greeks, their logos, and hence their philosophy and their sciences. By the way, this is quite difficult to understand if you, if, if you do not have a strong background in philosophy, uh, especially in philosophy of religion and the scholarship surrounding uh, Marian's uh, philosophy. But let me continue. You will get my points later on. You will get Marian's point later on. Of course, the ultimate, this Marian father writes, of course, the ultimate destiny of philosophy, the science of being that later became metaphysics, will render its identification with the science of God impossible. Yet one thing will not disappear. Christian theology's duty to rationality so that you will be guided, so that you will understand this, this point uh, uh, fully. Again, as I mentioned previously in the introductory parts of this, of, of, of this course, or of this lecture, that this duty to rationality is for Marian is duty to love, you know, the other to, to be, um, and, and, and in this case, love is understood as the reason, as the logos, and, and, and love, as reason, as the answer, as, as logos, as reason, or as the, as the great reason, is the answer to some of the problems of modernity. And what is this problem? Or what is this one of the important or key problems of modernity? As I mentioned a while ago, uh, this is the tendency of, 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 of the modern mind to reduce everything, including human beings, to objects to be manipulated to be used and things like that. Okay, so Christian uh, Christian theology. Yet one thing will not disappear. Christian theology's duty to rationality, duty to love. At times, it has even fulfilled its duty too well. At the risk of reducing the revealed word to a system of concepts. Yet this duty has nevertheless permitted the developments of a theology. And from the word theos, um, the Greek word theos, which means God, and logos, which means study or reason. And so theology is the study of God. Okay? Yet this duty has nevertheless permitted the development of a theology, of a study of God. A knowledge about God through reasons coming from God. Again, we have this capacity to know and demonstrate God through reason, and this reason is given by him. It's a gift from God. We take this accomplishment as self-evidence, but all things considered, it is achieved as such only in Christian religion. Because, again, we're talking about rationality as love, as the greatest reason, and... And this is not to be, this is not to undermine other religions, but, but of all the religions out there, I think, and I agree with, with many scholars, many religious scholars, many Christian scholars, that, that it is only Christianity that puts, all the Buddhism as well puts emphasis, premium on love. But, but in Christianity, there is the centrality of love. You know, the, the, the true love, the unconditioned love. God, in fact, in Christianity, we have the idea of God is love. And it plays a central role in Christian religion or in Christianity. 
So both um, um, both cases confirm that faith has a duty to reason in regard to itself. Indeed, for Marion, faith and reason are not opposed to each other, but faith has its own rationality, namely unfolding the reason of the Logos as the gift of love. So this is what I mentioned a while ago. So faith has, so when, when, uh, when, when, when Marion says, faith has its own rationality, and what is that rationality, what is the rational aspects of, of faith, Marion says, it's the unfolding of the reason of the logos, that is of the gift of love. And, and, and as you will know later on, love as the greatest, you know, as the great reason. Now, what reason things, uh, I, I now move to the second subsection of the essay, uh, Faith and Reason. Um, the, the subsection is titled, What Reason Thinks and What Does It Not Think? Now we may ask, if faith has its own rationality different from the rationality in science, and so on. Again, um, the uh, faith or faith's rationality or the rationality in faith is different from the rationality in science, because again, in the first place, as I already mentioned many times, um, faith's rationality is actually love. Okay? So it's, that's, that clearly shows that it's different from the idea of rationality in science. Maybe in science, you can think of rationality as, as logical or scientific thinking that involves several processes with rigorous processes and things like that. Okay. So if faith has its own rationality different from the rationality in science, then what kind of reason this is? What does it think? And what does it not, what it does not think? Okay, so let, 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 let's clarify this points again. The idea is the, the reason the rational, the reason that we can find in faith or the reason that Marion attach or attributes to uh, faith is different from the reason that we can find in science. Okay? So if that reason, if uh, faith or the reason attached to, attributed to faith, associated with faith is different from reason in science. So what does it think then? What it does not think, Marion says, this is a higher reason. So, reason and faith. Faith's rationality is a higher reason. One that we can get from thinking from divinity. And one that science cannot accept. Because that's irrational for science. You know? um, unacceptable to the world of science because according to Marion, science tends to shy away from the divine dimension. And so, of course, many of the scientists there, especially in the hard sciences, astronomers, uh, physicists, and things like that, they have the logical way of thinking. They don't believe, many of them, mainly not all, of course, many of them don't believe in, in the supernatural being, don't believe in the, in the, in the, religious or spiritual dimension. So this scientists believe that they can believe that what they know is all the mind can know. There's no divine dimension, spiritual dimension. And so science or the scientists in this case cannot accept that kind of reason. But for Marion, again, uh, faith's rationality is a higher type of reason because again, as I will show later, this is love. As Marion writes, the rationality of faith, the reason we attach to faith is unacceptable to science because for Marion, God is transcendence 
and our knowledge about God's transcendence can only be known by not being known. Okay? The rationality of faith, the reason we attach to faith is unacceptable to science. Because yeah, again, the rationality of faith, the reason we attach to faith is unacceptable to science because for Marian, God is transcendent. And our knowledge about God's transcendence can only be known by not being known. Now, the phrase can only be known by not being known appears to be a contradiction. That's a common um, phrase in, 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 in philosophy, in, in philosophy tradition. Knowing by not knowing. Now, what does Marion mean by this? Can only be known by not being known. Marion writes, our initial understanding to this is that God cannot be known through the senses. We cannot experience him. We cannot see and touch him. But the gift of reason tells us that there is always that something or someone that cannot be known, a mysterious being who that is responsible for everything, including the existence of evil. Okay. So God can only be known by not being known. In other words, I cannot know this God by way of my senses. In the wisdom, for example, we have the idea that the Tao cannot be known because the moment you say this is the Tao, that ceases to be the Tao. In other words, we can never come to know or we can never come to conceptualize God. We can only approximate. But again, the senses. Touch, taste, everything cannot access God. And yet, according to Marian and according to, and, and, and according to our, our many philosophers of religion as well, that look, after making sense, trying to conceptualize God, for example, and, and you know, in, in, in in trying to, to find God in the things or try to experience God, the human mind will soon realize that it cannot really know him. And yet, reason tells us that just like the unmoved mover of, 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 of Aristotle, that we cannot reason tells us that there must be a supreme being out there that there is always a mysterious being out there who is responsible for everything was responsible for 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 everything for the world and everything in it and that must be god okay so the moments you admit that i cannot the moments that we admit that we cannot know god that's when we know him by faith In addition, Marion adds, Marion adds the notion of the eye, which he refers to the body, to the flesh, which is connected to a great reason. For Marion, if you have, if you if you read the if you have read the essay, for Marion, the flesh does not mean the body that is perceived or or sensed. This is uh, this flesh. This flesh is the is the eye that senses the body and all things in the world. In other words, this flesh is the soul that is the ego. Okay, so uh, Marion mentions about the flesh in the essay, but again, he said this flesh is. Um, does not necessarily refer to the body that can be perceived, that can be sensed. 
he he even mentioned that this flesh is the one that senses beings that cannot sense the worst of material things. So as we can see, this flesh, this eye, this soul is the flesh that senses the bodies that themselves do not sense. So in, in, in Cartesian philosophy or in, in Cartesian dualism, there is the dualism between the mind and body. So in other words, uh, uh, um, we can um, um, equate Marian's notion of flesh with, with the mind. This is the ego, this is the soul, this is the eye that perceives things around it. And those things cannot perceive itself because they're not conscious. It is only the human person that has the ability to think. It is only the human person who can be conscious of itself and, and the things around him or her. That's the flesh. In other words, the flesh or the soul is conscious of itself and other things, objects or matter that cannot by themselves sense themselves. So in other words, following Descartes, we know that uh, Marian is a Cartesian, one of the authority of Cartesian philosophy. Marian, in other words, Marian is saying that it is only the flesh, it is only the eye, it's only the ego, it's only the mind that can, that can think and it's only the mind that can be conscious of itself and other things around him or her. And those things that around us, material beings, cannot sense or cannot sense of itself, cannot be conscious of itself because they don't have the capacity in the first place to do so. Now, two points need further clarification or consideration here. The flesh or the eye can think of immediate objects. Ego, the mind, can think of immediate objects, but at the same time, it can also think of something farther, something beyond what the flesh can sense. For example, the mysteriousness of beings or things. So what Marian is trying to say here is the eye, the flesh, that can think of things around itself, like the hardness of the table, the softness of the muscle, like tasting delicious cake, and other immediate experiences. And so the eye can think of it. The eye can experience these things, but Marion also says that the eye or the flesh can also think of things beyond what the eyes can see, beyond what the hand can touch. And that's, for example, the Mr. Eustace of being. Like, for example, again, the unmoved mover of a coin of, of, of Aristotle, the uncaused cause of a coin. Think, for example, of how mysterious the universe is. You know? This boundless entity, this boundless realm. If you think of the universe, look. It's eternal space. It's, and, and if you put a boundary to the universe, there's always the beyond the boundary. He puts another boundary, there's another beyond that boundary, and so on and so forth. And so we can think that this is endless, you know, mysterious universe. And if you think it's impossible for these things to come to be without the classic, you know, the classical, uh, the classic uh, arguments <laughs> in, 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 for God's existence, without the Supreme Being who's responsible for all this creation and creating these things. So what, what we're trying to say here is, in this, in, in this first paragraph, is that, again, for Marion, the mind or the eye can think of, can think of or can, can experience of, can think of things 
near itself and experience these things, hardness, softness, taste, sweets, bitter, and things like that. But at the same time, it can also think of other beings, mysterious beings beyond experience. For Marion, this is the problem with science, with technology, or modern thinking. It only thinks of what is immediate, of what is presented to the senses. So let me clarify this point. Because again, if you don't have a strong background in Marian and in philosophy of religion, when you read this faith and reason, it's, you will not understand. Um, of course, I'm talking to my students in philosophy of religion. Um, going back to the first paragraph, again, the, 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 the eye, the flesh, can think of immediate things, things that can be experienced but it can also think of mysterious being beyond experience. The second paragraph is saying that this, when, when, when Marion says, this is the problem with modern science or this is the problem with science, with technology, or when he says, this is the problem with modern thinking. He said, his, his, Marion says that the modern thinking focused only of what it can experience of what it can see, of what it can touch, of what it can, it can, it can prove. That's what Marion meant by this, the, the science or this scientist or this thinkers do not think of the divine dimension because they're just busy thinking about things that surround them that are near to them that they can experience in in if you're familiar with heidegger martin heidegger this is scientific thinking there are two kinds of thinking in heidegger scientific thinker thinking and meditative thinking Scientific thinking or calculative thinking is thinking of what, of, of what is given to you, well, of, what, of what you can experience, of what you can see. Okay. It thinks only of what makes you happy, what makes you full, what makes you satisfied. If, yeah, and if, and if that kind of thinking is applied to human relations, that kind of thinking is selfish thinking because that thinking only uses the other person as a means to the satisfaction, for example, of my own needs and wants. That kind of thinking, scientific thinking or calculated thinking do not or does not go beyond that. It does not acknowledge the mysteriousness of of the human person. That is why in calculative and or scientific thinking, people in that realm, in that dimension, in that world, that kind of thinking, people are just making use of each other, treating each other as a means towards a particular end. In other words, there's a selfish kind of thinking. This is exactly what Marion is referring to, that the eye or the flesh thinks only of this is, the, this is exactly what what Marion meant by uh, this is the problem of modern thinking of science of technology because that thinking only considers what's what's what is around what we can experience what we can take advantage of what we can use and things like that yeah? it only thinks of what is immediate of what is presented to the senses. As a result of that attitude, of that kind of thinking, reason reduces experience to objectifiable phenomena. We, for example, it, if, if, that kind of, if that kind of reason is applied to human relation. Marion is saying that 
it objectifies the human person. It dehumanizes the human person because look, it just uses the human person as an object to be manipulated, as, as, as an object to be, to be taken advantage of. And that kind of reason, the scientific reason, that modern thinking, that modern reason, ignores the flesh, the eye, the soul, which leads the modern person to succumb to ideology, according to Marian. That's what communism says. That's what capitalism says. That's what totalitarianism says. That's what, so that's, no, they succumb to that. And to the first, that is, reason reduces experience to objectifiable phenomena. For Marion, this is dangerous. Okay? That kind of reason, that scientific reason, the reason that characterizes the modern times. For Marion, this is dangerous because this is a selfish kind of reason as it reduces something or someone into objects that can be used or manipulated, as I already mentioned a while ago. For example, in human rela relations, we tend to relate with someone whom we can take advantage of, or we make friends with the rich and famous for some practical ends in mind. That is why we seldom see people establishing relationship, good relationship with, with the bad guys, you know, with, with the criminals, with other desp despicable, so to speak, beings, because we have that tendency to just use the other as some, something as someone that I can use. So for Marion, in this kind of reason, people are just using or manipulating each other. If this is the case with modern scientific reason, according to Marion, then what can we do now? Okay, remember that kind of reason is selfish, that scientific reason, selfish according to Marian, it's dangerous according to Marian. It does not acknowledge the mysteriousness of being. It is just concerned of what satisfies him or her. So what now? If that is the case with modern scientific reason, what can we do, especially as Christians? This leads us to the last point in Marian's faith and reason. Okay. The last subsection of the essay, the great reason of love. First of all, it must be noted that for Marian, everyone can contribute to the solution to this problem. Professors, students, workers, church workers, sales ladies, carpenters, fishermen, farmers, everyone can contribute to addressing the problem of selfish reason or scientific reason. And everyone can contribute to that. But Marion emphasized the role of Christians. And so, but, but, but what kind of contribution can and should Christians make to this common effort? According to Marion, the best that Christians can do here is to resort to Christ. Indeed, as the concrete embodiments of love, Christ therefore is the answer. So, Marion said, Christ is a concrete embodiment of love. In fact, we have, again, this, this common phrase in Christianity, in Catholicism, that God is love, and vice versa. God is love. And God is love, and love is God. And so, again, God's Jesus Christ, 
being the concrete embodiment of love. Therefore, Christ is the answer to this problem of scientific reason of the selfishness of the individuals. And again, science or the scientists cannot accept that fact. For Marion, only love can give access to the great reason. As we can see, love for Marion is revealed by the word, by the logos, reason. Hence, love unfolds itself as logos, according to Marion. Thus, as reason, logos, reason. Hence again, according to Marian, love is the reason. Christ is the reason. And in, in relation again to the problem of scientific thinking, the danger of scientific thinking, Marian says again and again and again that love is the answer to that, that Christ is the answer to that. That is why. According to Marion again, just to reiterate, that anybody, farmers, carpenters, fishermen, politicians, priests, nuns, Buddhists, everyone, Muslims, name it, everyone can contribute to, to addressing that phenomenon, that issue, that problem. But, but as also mentioned a while ago, Marion puts emphasis on the Christians because, because again, love plays a central role in Christian religion. Marion writes, and it is a reason by full right because it allows us to reach the closest and the innermost phenomena, those experienced by the flesh and those that intuition saturates. If the revelation of Christ, if the revelation of Christ had shown only this, namely that love has its reason, a forceful, original, simple reason that sees and says what common reason, scientific reason, what common or scientific reason misses and does not see, it would already have saved, if not humans, at least the reason. Marian Father writes, but Christ has not only shown the logic of love, but he has also demonstrated and proven, proven it in deeds and actions by his passion and his resurrection. So the greatest love of all is Christ's love. Since the coming and the presence of the Logos among us, love has not only found its logic, but it, has, but it has also accomplished it all the way to the end. Marion Father writes, love not only gives, let me just read this, 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 this long you know, petitions. Love not only gives itself in truth in the gesture of Christ in his crucifixion, but we must go to the point of turning this proposition upside down. That is, in Christ, love is manifested at the last and as the last and first truth. In Christianity, again, there, that is why there is the centrality of love in Christianity. Because again, as Marion writes, okay, love is in, in, in Christ, love is manifested as the last and first truth the one that makes all the others possible and recapitulates them all at the end of ends. Diba? She, this is a very famous um, um, biblical passage. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but me. 
So I am the way, the truth, John 14, 6, 14, 2. I just quoted Marian here. Marian continues, one can challenge this claim as an illusion without future, denounce it as presumptuous delusion, or even fear it as corruption of the young. The case of, in the case of Socrates, when he was accused of corrupt the young in Athens. In any case, Christians have nothing else to say than this, because they have received it as it is. Now, what kind of reason does the logic of love unfold? There is this logic of love. What kind of reason yeah, does this logic of, logic of love unfold? Let me just not, let, let me just read all these passages because so I cannot summarize this because yeah, um, Marion though beautifully, succinctly, beautifully frame it. So again, uh, the what kind of reason does the logic of love unfold? And uh, Marion gave four points for responses to that. First is certainty. For love, according to Marion, for love bears all, believes all, hopes all, endures all. This means that love always, this means that love always loves without condition, never on condition, in particular, uh, not on the condition, in particular, not on the condition of reciprocity. Love does not require a return on its investments in order to love, because it enjoys an unprecedented privilege in regard to any economy. Okay? A love one refuses or scorns. In short, a love that is not returned remains no less a perfect love accomplished without remainder. A gift refused remains no less. Uh, a gift refused remains no less a gift given. Actually, to love thus depends only on love. Creation follows from this as the unconditioned and unilateral precedence of love over being. The certainty of the, the logic of love. Second, second possibility, according to Marion, for nothing is impossible for love, especially the ability to love without regard of persons, to the point of loving one's enemy. Precisely because love requires only itself in order to love. God is characterized by the privilege of the impossibility of impossibility. It is even one of his properties, a privilege comparable to no other. What is impossible for mortals is not impossible for God. For God, all things are possible. Again, that's the answer to the question. What reason, what kind of reason does the logic of love unfold? Certainty, possibility. And thir third, self-knowledge. For we have seen that if our I wants to be grounded in thought, this existence performed by thought is still exposed to two threats. Either the illusion of thoughts or the suspicion of nihilism. And thus says St. Paul, Saint Paul, anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. Remember, knowing by not knowing. Yet how must one know in order to know oneself assuredly? One must let oneself be known by God, and for that one must love him. Anyone who loves God is known by him. To know oneself by thought, yes, but not by my thought, by God's thought. Instead, by that of him who thinks of me. 
in loving me and only makes himself known to whoever loves him. One must have come to know God or rather to be known by God. Hence, the other who loves me reveals himself to be more interior to me than I am to myself. And fourth, authority of the other. For love alone achieves knowledge of the other because it supremely believes in the other. When you love the other, when, when you love the other, you respect that other, you help that other, and so on, and the like. Indeed, in order to know what, love, what it loves, love has no need to represent or conceptualize it. That is to say, to reduce the known to its own. Or rather, what it loves will appear to it to the exact extent to which, by loving it, it will aim at it. And by aiming at it, it will move itself into it. Only love can, can, only love can know beyond itself because it alone displaces itself outside of itself and can know the love of Christ because that's the nature of Christ's love which surpasses all knowledge. Such a knowledge by transfer into the known, actually, in, actually into the beloved, is called communion, being with others, respecting the other, loving the other, be one with the other. It alone allows via love attainments to the incomprehensible transcendence of the other. As we can see, faith as viewed in the context of love does not lack rationality or reason because in the first place, this love is the very reason or rationality of faith. And so before I proceed, um, the initial, the introductory part talks about the, the, the seemingly contradictory nature of faith and reason. It also talks about thinkers and philosophers who argue that faith and reason are not contradictory or they are in harmony with each other. And, and we may think, at first glance, we may think of, um, we, we might be preoccupied, preoccupied of, of, you know, thinking about other nature and characteristics of love. But when we go to, when we go to Marian or Marian's take on faith and reason, he has a different take on it because his, his concern or Marian's concern is not just to distinguish one from the other, to distinguish faith from reason or his argument is he argues that yeah um they are complementary they're not opposed to each other but he goes beyond that mario now establishes the idea that introduces the idea that faith has its reason and that reason is indeed love Marion writes, and faith then will not lack assurance. For as faith in love, it loves already. Thus already unfolds the logic of love. It is not faith that is defined as the shadow of future things, but the promise of the law. Faith itself already attains the reality of things hoped for because it finds in its practice already the conviction of things not seen. And on the last note, let me quote Marion once more. Reason so far has been content with interpreting the world. Hence, 
with transforming it into objects that it masters. It is time for it to begin to respect them. Respecting the world means seeing, hence envisioning the face of the other human being. And that is only possible in the figure of love. Following its logic and in the light of its glory, Christians have nothing better to propose to the rationality of humans. So just a last note, again, just to reiterate my points, that Marion, in his, in his similar essay, Faith and Reason, does not, did not just intend to distinguish faith from reason, or did not just attempt to justify that faith and reason are not opposed to each other. Well, that's part of the package deal, but one of the most important points that we learn from Marian's faith and reason is that when we say faith has its own rationality, he was, or Marian was referring to love as the great reason. And another thing, important thing to remember again, just to summarize is, um, um, Marion argues that the modern, the contemporary periods, that the modern uh, science or the modern way of thinking is a scientific thinking, is a selfish thinking. It thinks only of what is immediate, of what can be seen, of what can be experienced. And so in that kind of thinking, there is no love. It's not employing love. That selfish thinking is making use of the other. It disrespects the other. It dehumanizes the other. The modern society is, I should say, characterized by that kind of thinking, scientific thinking, modern thinking, the flesh thinking of, the, of what it can, you know, get from the other what it can get, get in that kind of relationship. So there is no love in that kind of thinking. And so in one way or the other, Marion is saying this contemporary society, this modern thinking lacks love. And so I should remember he asked the question, so if this is the situation now, if this is the condition now of the modern society, what can we do now? And that is why Marion offers the love of Christ and argue the and, and because Christ is love and love is the greater is the great reason and then Marion puts more emphasis on the Christians themselves who can greatly contribute in addressing the problem the selfishness of the modern world although Marion did not deny the fact that other beings, other denominations, or everybody can contribute to the solution. But again, but then again, there is the emphasis or Marian emphasis emphasized the role of the Christians because in the first place in Christianity, there is the centrality of the idea of love. That is the answer to this problem. Thank you so much. <laughs>